This is episode 7 of Eco Gorillas, written and read by Scott A. J. Johnson. For more information, visit ecogorillas.com. That's gorilla with two R's and two L's. To support this project and get early access to all the chapters, head over to patreon.com slash sajjohnson. If you've gotten this far, I hope you're enjoying it, so take a minute and tell a friend. If you've done that, please consider leaving this podcast a review on iTunes, YouTube, or wherever you listen. And thanks. This podcast contains fleeting, explicit language. Chapter 14, 1.6, Revolution. We are unsure of what the world will look like after a revolution, but with the current suffering amid such material wealth, we are willing to roll the dice and hope for a more meaningful future for humans as part of the Earth's biome. We are living, but are we alive? One might ask why we are not content to live our own lives according to the ecological precepts we have laid out and leave the rest of the world alone. The way our society and economy have been built has tied us all together in a global chain of destruction. Individual action alone will not break that chain. Even if half the population decide to join us, the rest would simply use more. It is clear that our society cannot control itself. In the face of overwhelming scientific consensus and dire predictions, we do nothing because we cannot be inconvenienced. All other avenues have been exhausted. If a peaceful change was going to happen, it would have already taken place. By the time the rest of society realizes that the crisis is upon us, it'll be far too late. We could attempt to push our ideas through the existing democratic process, but this brings up two problems. First, existing processes are not truly democratic, and with such large countries, the individual's voice is drowned out. We advocate for true democracy on a small scale, where it's most effective. Second, the existing processes are firmly controlled by the people causing the problem, namely the fossil fuel industry. Even if a majority of public opinion coalesced behind these ideas, our elected officials would not go against their constituency, which is not the voters, but the industries that bankroll their elections. End of chapter. Chapter 15. Planning the Fateful Day. Late Fall, 2015. It's gorgeous here, said Lauren, as she hiked down the valley floor, clambering over granite boulders and stream wash that hemmed in the now-complacent Lower Rock Creek. Each year after the winter melt, the creek swelled and overtopped its bank, carving out the base of cliffs that towered above. The rest of the year, the valley is one of the best hiking spots in Missouri, except for the snakes. In online forums, other hikers had related tales of the rampant cottonmouth population in the valley. One said that while backing away from one of the vipers, she tripped over another. To avoid any potential complications, the group had decided to hike after the first freeze of the year, when they were less likely to encounter not only the snakes, but endemic chiggers, ticks, and mosquitoes that made the lower Midwest late summer hiking awful. The ranks had also swelled from the hike that started it all just a short year ago. Eva, Eric, Brett, Lauren, and Andy, the original five, had recruited Jason, Josh, Sonny, Kate, David, Leslie, Jair, Haley, Becca, and Anthony. Half the group had gone with Lauren through the valley bottom, while the others had decided to traverse the bluffs that surrounded the valley to practice their orienteering skills. Both groups had marked a campsite on their maps and decided to meet there before sundown. Lauren's half of the group had just taken a water break at the inside bend of the creek. Their bank sloped to the water's edge, but the other side was a granite cliff over 300 feet high. The last time they had been here, Eric bored everybody to death with an impromptu geology lecture about the dynamics of water erosion in a river valley. Lauren remembered this spot because of the bend in the creek and the cave under the opposite cliff base. What had been a hollow a few years ago was now a pile of granite boulders. The lower cliff face had collapsed, as Eric had predicted. If Eric was here, she said to the resting group, he'd be getting a lecture about how that cliff wall over there collapsed since the last time we hiked through. Oh, cool, said Haley, who was also an archaeologist and had a good understanding of earth sciences. I suppose the creek had eroded the base outside the bend? Not you too, said Lauren, smiling at Haley. The other half of the group, meanwhile, was pushing up a particularly steep slope, using the grass and stunted pines as hand and footholds. Do we have to go in a straight line between sight points? Jason sweated under his pack. Sonny gave him a tight-lipped grin. No, I just wanted the workout. In the next valley, we'll sight across and then go around the rim. It'll be much easier. Ah, spoil sport, said Eric. His shirt was wet with perspiration. You can go down it up by yourself then, smartass, Jason said. You know what? What? Jason feigned exasperation. If you two would shut up, said David, pointing down into the valley, you might have seen the rest of our group down there taking a water break. Kate cupped her hands. Hey, you guys! A few seconds later, their friends looked around. Haley pointed upwards and everybody waved. The sound bounces around down there, said Sonny. At the top of the next hill, it was Eva's turn to sight their bearing. They had drawn a straight line from the trailhead to the site, found the bearing, and traversed the distance by taking a series of of line-of-sight readings on their compasses. This was old hat to a few of them, but good training for the rest. They continued along this sight line for another hour before they saw the campsite below them, sitting on a high spot in the valley floor, just inside another curve in the creek. The others were already there, gathering deadfall for the fire. 
They made the rest of the descent without incident and were soon drinking water and munching on some mixed nuts and dried fruit with the rest of the group. A few hours later, after the tents had been pitched, sleeping bags spread out, and wood and water gathered, everybody sat around the fire as their stew bubbled on coals that had been scraped to one side of the pit. More than one stomach rumbled. Did everybody get through the reading? asked Eric. I couldn't put the stuff down, Josh said. I especially like The World Without Us, said Becca. I think it is the most instructive book of the bunch, since we're going to have to deal with all these industrial human systems and consequences once everything is shut down. Note. Wiseman, 2007. End of note. Sonny nodded. And we're going to have to derive new subsistence patterns that fit within the natural flow of a post-industrial world, which is basically what Wiseman describes. I'm still worried about getting everyone on board with this, said Andy. The typical first worlder is too used to industrial agriculture and processed foods. Too few people know how to cook, let alone process food from field to table. This is a big part of the gamble. Look through history. People riot when they're hungry. Maybe that's why our society is complacent. We're fat and lazy. Anthony raised his hand. Another problem is potable water. Even the most poorly prepared people could get by for a few days on the food in their house, but if the water shuts down, they'd be dehydrated in a day. And on top of that, we have to deal with human waste. Most of these systems run on electricity to pump everything. In the long term, said David, I think the most dangerous and potentially catastrophic failure that will come after we carry out our plan is the meltdown of the 400-odd nuclear plants around the world. It was 441 reactors, 99 of which are in the U.S., at about 60-some plants, Brett said. Right, David continued. Wiseman described the best-case scenario as still pretty dire. Nuclear plant operators would stuff the reactors with control rods, which would reduce the temperature. Even still, the cooling water is circulated by pumps that run on diesel generators, and they would run out in a week or so. The water would start to evaporate and spurt out of pressure valves. Once enough water evaporates, the fuel hits the air and ignites or explodes, sending out a cloud of radioactive-laden steam and smoke to rain down on its surroundings. And the worst-case scenario? asked Haley. If the plants were left running, the whole thing would happen even faster. Everybody was silent, watching the fire crackle and send out little jets of sparks, mimicking the nuclear contamination spreading across their new world. The reactors aren't all we have to worry about. Fourteen pairs of eyes turned towards Eric. The reactors usually have stronger walls and redundant layers of, of containment. It is the spent fuel storage pools, which might be in less robust buildings. So it's a double challenge, said Brett. Essentially, yes. Uh, I have a friend who was looking into shutting down nuclear power plants through some less than conventional means. If you guys are cool with me talking to him, I'll pick his brain. If I remember right, he had some ideas about long-term, safe shutdowns. Maybe we should give the government some notice. Like, just a little week, maybe? Said Haley. Eric scribbled in his notebook. That's an interesting idea. What does everyone think? Well, why not? Said Lauren. They might make the major changes we need if they realize they have everything to lose if we go through with our plan. Brett raised his hand. We've been telling them that continued reliance on fossil fuels and global warming would make us lose everything, and they didn't listen to that. I vote no notice. If we telegraph what we're about to do, said Sonny, they'll up security measures and we won't succeed. They won't take our threat seriously, and they'll be able to undermine our plan. I'm a no on that. Once it starts, we can warn people anyway, Andy said. Maybe we should start with actions guaranteed not to hurt people and then put out warnings. What about the army, said Leslie? We're never going to be able to compete with their weapons or size. Everybody looked at Sonny, the only veteran in the group. No, you're right. There's only one thing we can do with the military. Hobble them by taking away their gas. If they don't have that, they don't have air power, they can't mobilize troops. Therefore, the first thing to go has to be the gas infrastructure, especially strategic fuel reserves. The pipelines to these reserves have to go first. They'll be guarded, but they have to go. Otherwise, the military will have maneuverability. Once we cut out their legs from under them, we'll have more of an advantage since they're built to, as a mechanized force and we aren't. If we can get public support behind us and communities rise up, said Kate, the military will be loath to shoot their own people. If the populace is with us, if we can generate support, we won't need to overcome their arms. If we can get through the first week, they'll get the message. What if the government tries to concede, asked Josh. Brett scoffed. Even if that wildly optimistic outcome were to happen, what are we supposed to do? They're bought and sold by the fossil fuel and business interests. They don't represent us. They represent those that are destroying the world. Even halfway through the week, even if things are going well... All we can do is ask them to abdicate and throw their weight behind us. We can't negotiate with them. We don't negotiate with terrorists, supposedly, and that's what they are. They don't know it or recognize it. They'd be upset to don that mantle, but that's what they're doing, and I think we're all agreed on that. Nods all around. How are we going to shut down the transportation networks? asked Andy. Until the gas runs out, everyone's going to have maneuverability. What about finding choke points in the transportation system and blocking them? said Josh. What if... We can find road cuts with unstable rocks. I don't want to waste our probably limited supplies of explosives on filling up road cuts, but a few key mountain passes would shut down interstates. We might be able to flood roads somehow. 
Alternatively, most of us have personal vehicles and we won't need them anymore, so I'm just thinking out loud here. One thing might be getting groups of people to drive in groups of six under an overpass without an exit, turn the vehicle sideways, douse them with gas, and torch them so there's no way around them without having to pull off and drive a ways around. You know, overpasses without nearby exits, like when country roads cross a major interstate, then skedaddle out of there and keep our work going elsewhere. Even after they clear the wrecks, the traffic snarl would really hamper emergency response on the first day. Eric grinned. Geez, you're hired. We can shut down the rail system using their flag system, Sonny said. Have I told you about this yet? No? Okay. When I was working on a train line doing survey, they taught us about their safety measures. They rely on a system of flags in addition to their radios. The flags are the fail-safe. We'll look for a major crossing where rail lines meet, where a stop train would tie up lots of track and roads. Two miles up, we put yellow flags, warning the engineers an emergency stop is coming up. They'll slow down and stop by the red flags. They won't pass the red flags, especially ones put on the track because of strict regulations. Even if the radio tells them to go, even if they see the tracks ahead of them are clear, they won't go until the flags have been removed and the reason has been explained by somebody who put the flag there. Usually this is for emergency clearing of the track, and if we get 50 crews to do this to shut down the rail traffic at the best choke points, it would shut down rail traffic for at least the day. Hell, a dozen crews could wreak havoc. Even if they send out radio messages to ignore the flag signals, a lot of engineers will probably open obey the flags anyway. They'll be too worried about passing through the flags, especially if you throw debris on the track, say a hundred yards down the track, have a burned out car. They'll stop dead in their tracks. (laughs) Get it? Tracks? Trains? (laughs) Eva let out a low whistle. That takes care of rails and roads. Although it wasn't perfect, Lights Out had some good points about shutting down the electrical grid, both in terms of how to do it and the results. Note, Koppel, 2015. End of note. I've got a few ideas about taking down long-distance transmission towers. A small amount of explosives on the feet of the towers, especially on the corners, would bring down these uninsulated high-voltage wires, causing a major short circuit. You could even short them by shooting a cable over them to close the gap, said Eric. It would be especially effective to do this at peak transmission time, said Anthony. Sonny raised his hand. We could have people target the substations. Some folks did that in rifles near San Jose in 2013. And the Transformers, Lauren said. There was something in the book about how they're old, custom-made, not easily replaced, and hard to transport. Sounds like a vulnerability to me. Yeah, I think we're agreed that the grid is going down, said Becca. But we have to look seriously at how to keep people alive when it happens. Everyone around the fire nodded in agreement. Jair raised his hand. I work near pipelines, and I know that a few well-placed explosions would kill much of the network. Becca grimaced. Wouldn't that make major oil and natural gas leaks? Not necessarily, Jair said. At pump stations, which are usually isolated sheds where the pipeline comes up to the surface, they have emergency check valves that shut down the flow when the pressure changes. If we blew a few choice pipe substations, it would plug it all up. If we can get all those systems down the first day, said Eric, we'll be sitting pretty. We'll have latitude to carry out the rest of our plans. What about communications? asked Leslie. Shouldn't we cut phone and internet lines? I don't know, said Eva. On the one hand, if we cut the communications lines, it'll hamper the government's response. But on the other hand, it's something we might have to have to rebuild afterwards. If we can successfully kill the electricity, it might black out enough of the communications to give us room to move. The important thing is to not get caught so we can keep the plan rolling. We strike and leave no occupying positions. Eric nodded. Each group will have to split into small teams and hide out in the woods during this week. And the week before, we'll have to launch a huge PR campaign, said Kate, so that society doesn't see this as a calamity. They see it as a challenge, a challenge they have to meet, sacrifices they have to make, and things they have to do. They'll be taken by surprise, but they'll have to be prepared. Somehow. I think we should get to work to get the government to sponsor a disaster preparedness day, Lauren said, and then we should do it right after. Everyone will have a week's worth of food and water in their houses. I've done some checking into governmental preparedness. I think we can agitate to bolster the existing CERT system. The U.S. has over 2,000 community emergency response teams, but that's pretty weak right now. How would we swing that? asked Andy. A mole in the government? Uh, Or an HHS? Part of my work will be to find somebody with influence in the government to champion this idea and improve it by storing supplies in neighborhood locations and creating a system of block captains. Maybe even a national holiday that everyone gets off and first aid training and courses are free all over the country. You know, the government surprisingly does something right. We strike soon after that. Eric raised his hand. I vote for a day in the fall, when we have the maximum just harvested grain levels so that we can make it through the winter, when the corn and winter wheat have been harvested. The peak grain transport period is October to February. We can cement it with the threat of dropping the GMO-loving insects, and I think I know the guy for that, Uh, and then we'll have the winter to plan and plant. 
Even if we don't have all the answers to all the problems yet, said Eva, I think we have a good handle on what the challenges are. Eric flipped through his notebook. I suppose we have diverging paths from now on. Part of our efforts will be directed towards shutting it down, and the other will be with managing the collapse. I've noted down the major tasks in each category. For shutting it down, I've got government, transportation, power, and communications. We certainly have subsets within these tasks, like power includes long-distance transmission lines, coal, nuclear power plants, and so on. For management, I have water, food, social tranquility and community building as short-term problems, and subsistence as a long-term one. If you guys agree, I think it might be worth picking a point person on each of these topics. Some topics probably need to be divided among a few people who can concentrate on different sub-areas. Any counter-proposals? Around the campfire, heads shook. Leslie's hands went up. If we're lead on one area, can we still get help from the other leads? Oh, for sure, said Eva. We should try and compartmentalize our operations as much as we can, so that if one of us is picked up, we can't give away everyone else's plans. But if we want advice, we should be able to consult each other. Eric readied his notebook. All right, does anybody have any pet ideas they'd like to head up, or maybe one we should add to the list? In the ensuing 20 minutes, volunteers spoke up, partnerships were made, and duties assigned. Eva would head up the destruction, the first phase of their plan. In addition, she, Brett, and Jair would handle bringing down the electric grid by taking out power lines, coal plants, and nuclear plants, respectively. Andy, Josh, Sonny, and Jason volunteered to break the transportation infrastructure by shutting down cars, roadways, trains, and pipelines, respectively. It fell to Lauren to both stymie the government's response and use their infrastructure to help prepare the nation. The immediate aftermath, or Phase 2, would be managed by Anthony, who had worked in the Federal Emergency Management Administration and was a volunteer in New Orleans right after Katrina hit. He would coordinate the aftermath and focus on clean water. David volunteered to manage the post-shutdown food, and Kate was going to work on social tranquility and cohesion. She said she already had some ideas for social media and propaganda campaigns to prime the well. Phase 3, that is long-term planning, was going to be overseen by Eric. His immediate area was going to be subsistence, but he would coordinate the community-building efforts of Leslie, who volunteered to be in charge of education, Haley, governance, and Becca, health. Each person would create a plan and share it with their group leader. After a plan was worked out, new people with skills specific to that plan had to be found, recruited, and trained. Although everybody had a different area of responsibility, they would be helping with each phase as it came. That is, during the week of destruction, everybody would have a role to play. The same would be true in the immediate aftermath and the long-term management. Lauren, for example, would shift to help Haley and Becca after her role in holding back the existing government had been completed in the first phase. After another half hour sorting out responsibilities and creating teams, Eric looked around the group with a smile. Well, I think that about settles everything except who's going to wash dishes in the creek now that it's dark. Finger shot to the tips of noses amidst a clamor of not it. End of chapter. End of episode 7 of Eco Gorillas. For more, visit ecogorillas.com.